The romance of railway steam traction is today but a memory, bar a few exceptions. In 1769, Frenchman Cugnot succeeded in driving a steam-powered wagon for the first time. Due to the lack of decent steering, however, that experiment ended prematurely in a smashed wall. But it ignited the flame with many a daredevil trying their hand at steam traction. In February 1804, Richard Trevithick first succeeded in operating a steam locomotive on rails of the Penny Darren foundry in Wales. It took another 25 years for the steam locomotive to mature into a serious proposition. Prior to Rocket winning the Rainhill Trials of 1829, George Stevenson and his son Robert had been building locomotives for 15 years. But it was the Rocket that combined all the elements that would lead to the success of the steam locomotive. In France, Marc Seguin also came very close. His locomotive of 1829 also featured a multi-tubular boiler to improve heat exchange and steam production. Two vertically mounted cylinders drove four wheels in a similar fashion to earlier Stevenson locomotives. But he used large blowers to provide drafting instead of blasting exhaust steam up the chimney. Trevithick had already discovered this essential drafting effect back in 1804. The rocket's boiler had a strange appearance. The firebox was still a separate component riveted to the rear of the boiler barrel. The chimney protruded from the other side of the barrel with a strange bend. There was no smoke box. From each cylinder, a brass pipe led to the chimney to provide draft for the fire. This looks more familiar. From right to left, we see a smoke box, the boiler barrel, and the firebox at the rear. In the boiler, water was heated to produce steam by burning fuel like coal or oil. The pressure of the steam was then used to drive the wheels. Boilers are round because such a shape is well suited to cope with high pressures. But the aft end is not round. Here, the grate forms the bottom of a box, the firebox. From below, air enters the firebox between the bars of the grate. The inner firebox is a separate element within the boiler shell. This is best explained in a cross-section of the boiler. In the firebox on the left, a fire has been built on the grate. The boiler is filled with water to a level above the inner firebox. A brick wall diverts the flames and hot gases to the rear for a more even distribution of heat across the firebox. Then, the hot gases pass through the many tubes to exchange even more heat before entering the smoke box. On the run, a blast pipe centered precisely under the chimney used exhaust steam from the cylinders to drive the hot gases into the atmosphere. This created the typical exhaust beat of a steam locomotive. When a locomotive has to work harder, more steam passes through the blast pipe. The sound increases and so does the draft for the fire. This interaction between boiler and machinery is unique to the steam locomotive. The blast pipe does not work when the locomotive is standing still or being fired up. As soon as pressure rises, the blower is switched on. The blower is simply a round tube with holes located near the nozzle of the blast pipe. Like the blast pipe, the blower creates a vacuum in the smoke box, which draws the hot gases through the tubes and air into the firebox.
There is no draft when the blower is switched off, so beware. When the boiler pressure rises too high, the safety valves pop open. By law, every steam locomotive must have at least two safety valves. When steam is consumed, the water level in the boiler naturally drops. This is shown on the water gauges. The boiler must be fed in time to prevent the firebox from overheating. If that happens, the boiler risks an explosion. Pioneer locomotives had rod-driven pumps to feed the boiler. Long station stops required the locomotives to be uncoupled and driven back and forth to feed the boiler. The injector, introduced in 1859, made that unnecessary. Water and fuel supplies were carried in a tender trailing the locomotive, whose capacity depended on the size of the locomotive and the distance it had to travel. On short runs, fuel supplies could be carried on the locomotive itself. Such locomotives were known as tank engines. An advantage of the tank engine was that they could run fast both ways. The rocket featured two cylinders placed on the outside. Each piston rod was attached through a crosshead and a connecting rod to the drive wheel. In the cylinders, steam worked on both sides of the piston, pushing it back and forth. A valve admits steam to the cylinder on one side of the piston whilst exhausting it on the other side at the same time. The steam chest of a small industrial locomotive shows how the valve opens a port. In normal operation, this space is occupied by live steam pushing the slide valve onto its seat. At the same time, the hollow underside of the slide valve connects the other port to an exhaust passage not visible here. The exhaust passage is linked to the blast pipe under the chimney. Let's look at one side of the piston. Steam is admitted just before the piston reaches the end of its stroke. At some point during the new stroke, the admission of steam is cut off. From that moment on, the steam contained in the cylinder pushes the piston by expanding. Just before reaching the other end of the stroke, the expanded steam is exhausted for almost the entire return stroke. Just before the other end, live steam is admitted again. The same happens on the other side of the piston. The valve is operated by the valve gear. This is the Allen Trick valve gear, one of many to be used. It closely resembles the Stevenson gear, which was the most extensively used in the 19th century. There are two eccentrics mounted on the main driver, one for forward and one for reverse. They drive the expansion link, which in turn moves the radius rod and the valve back and forth. In full forward or full reverse gear, the expansion link is connected to one of the eccentrics. Nobody knew what the middle positions of the expansion link would do when the Stevenson gear was invented in 1841. Then, the motion of both eccentrics is mixed and the locomotive begins to run a lot more economically. Some steam left in the cylinder cools to water, and while steam can be compressed, water certainly cannot. Too much water in the cylinder may cause severe damage as the piston reaches its end position. Cylinder cocks allow the water to escape and can also be opened to allow preheating of cold cylinders. The connecting rods did not move up and down simultaneously. 
The cranks on the drive wheels were mounted at a right angle. This so-called quartering, something conceived by Murray in 1812, enables locomotives to start without help. A crank was pushed or pulled four times per revolution. This tram locomotive has its entire weight available for traction because of the coupling rods connecting both axles. The weight with which two wheels on an axle push on the rails is called axle load. The axle load of all driven axles together is called the adhesion weight. This locomotive has inside cylinders. A peak under the boiler shows the drive in action. With all those different locomotives around, it soon became necessary to describe the wheel arrangement. A distinction is made between driving wheels and load-bearing or load-carrying wheels. This is a 060, meaning six drive wheels and no load-carrying wheels leading or trailing the drivers. Load-bearing wheels that are not driven support and spread the weight of a locomotive along the line. The Saxonia is a 042 with four drive wheels and two carrying wheels trailing them. This is a 462 or Pacific. Many wheel arrangements received names as well. Express locomotives usually featured a bogey with four wheels under the front end. The six foot seven inch drivers allowed a safe top speed of 87 miles an hour. Freight duty. Ten relatively small driver wheels allow only a 50 mile an hour top speed but provide plenty of traction. For decades, the design of a steam locomotive was largely based on feel and know-how rather than science. The same good steam boiler design was used on many totally different locomotives. This 282, with a safe speed of 56 miles an hour, features the same boiler as a speedy 18201, capable of 112 miles an hour. One of the most important functions of a steam locomotive is stopping. Trains must be able to stop at all times. Today, it is hard to imagine that nothing was available until George Westinghouse presented his air brake system in 1871. Until then, a handbrake on the tender was all that was available in most cases. The air brake system works with a steam-operated air compressor to pressurize the air brake line throughout the train. To apply the brakes, the driver releases air from the train line with the brake lever. The brake cylinders then push the brake shoes against the wheels. 